Good morning. It's good to see one out this morning to receive from the Lord's word and sacrament. If you have your announcement sheet, ask you to please take that out as you're so doing, as is typical. Please fill out the blue book at the end of the pew and pass it on down. Return it back to its spot. Um, as we can look for the week here at St. Paul's, brief mention elder meeting following the service today. The rest of the week, we can see uh, various activities and so forth. Uh, with a brief mention to next Saturday, we have an LYF meeting at noon and a fall cleanup. Uh, if you're able to be around, we oftentimes see these things printed, and at least I know I do. It's like, oh, fall cleanup, somebody else will take care of it. But I encourage you, if you're able to come give a hand, there's always work to be done. And so that'll be on Saturday, uh, whether it's outside work or even helping out here in the, the inside of the church with uh, various things for uh, cleaning the church up, which happens twice a year. It'll be on Saturday at 8, so if you can make it out, that'd be great. At the very back, there's some information. There's a fall rally for LWML coming up. Also, it says End Times Roundtable. What on earth is that? Um, I've been asked to speak at a debate here in town on the End Times. And so there are going to be four different views on the end times of the book of Revelation. I was asked to represent our stance as a church. And so uh, if you're able to make it out for that uh, box, I mean that debate, we'll say it. Uh, It will be a friendly debate, obviously, but it will definitely be a debate. Uh, That will be on October 7th and 8th, uh, so keep that in mind. If you have more questions, talk to me after the service about that. Are there any other announcements that need to be mentioned at this time that I may have overlooked? Well, this morning we are the 17th week after Trinity, and we encounter several wonderful texts, but more specifically Ephesians chapter 4. We'll be talking about unity today. Who creates unity and what is it? Uh, We'll hear more about that in Ephesians as well as the sermon. But before we do so, our opening hymn of invocation is hymn number 850, excuse me, hymn number 850, hymn number 850. Congregation, please stand as we turn to 151. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, Have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the intro printed on the inside of your bulletin, sung to the tune of C. Righteous are you. salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
before you, grant your people grace to withstand the temptation of the devil and with pure hearts and minds to follow you, the only God. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. The Old, Testament for the, the Old Testament reading for the 17th Sunday after Trinity is from Proverbs chapter 25. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. What your eyes have seen, do not hastily bring into court. For what will you do in the end when your neighbor puts you to shame? Argue your case with your neighbor himself. And do not reveal another secret. Lest he who hears you bring shame upon you, and your ill repute have no end. A word fitly spoken is like apples of a gold in a setting of silver. Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Like the cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him. He refreshes the soul of his masters. Like clouds and winds without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he does not give. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 14th chapter. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited, when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated for the hymn of the day, hymn number 557.
in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's no doubt about it, my friends, that tribalism, yes, tribalism, has been like a new virus infecting all aspects of our society. Many political commentators are commenting on it. Many sociologists are writing on this phenomenon. Now, I'm not talking about a tribalism that exists with such things such as sports teams. You know what I'm talking about. We're not talking about tribalism where perhaps we have a strong affiliation for the Minnesota Vikings or the Packers, the kind of tribalism that we gather with devotion around a team and then we do everything possible to, well, stick it to the other team, to trash talk those Packers. Again, we're not talking about this kind of tribalism over things such as football or the kind of a car a person drives or even the brand of gun that they shoot. Instead, we are talking about a tribalism where people gather around a person a mindset, an idea, or an agenda, which then always seems to lead to strong opinions against another group, the they or them over there. You see, with tribalism, yes, with tribalism, you always, you always need to have a villain. With tribalism, you always need to have a boogeyman, if you will, someone to demonize. And so once a group is formed tribalistically, the group will then begin to cluster together and then form opinions about another group and then label that group as evil, which then in return they will attack that other group in which the other group will feel the attack and then return that attack back to the other group. Lines will be drawn in the sand. Everyone will feel like they have to, what, join a tribe. As a result, when tribalism takes effect, people will be walking on pins and needles, as they say, making sure, well, we better not say this word or we better not say that word. We should act this way and not act that way, and so forth, and so forth. Now, tribalism really wouldn't be that big of a problem. It wouldn't be that bad, except for the fact that once a person is in a tribe, they have to be completely loyal. Yes, they have to be completely loyal to their social group above all else. Furthermore, once in a group, The tribe just cannot seem to leave the other tribe alone. They have to compete. They have to fight to get their own way. They have to eliminate the competition. In our reading from the epistle of Ephesians this morning, the apostle Paul, he confronts tribalism right there in the church of Ephesus. You see, in that time and in that day, there was tension in that church of Ephesus between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. Obviously, this tension was great to the point that it created a rival between the groups. And so right there in that early church, right there in that early church in 60 AD, some 30 years after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, right there in that church of Ephesus, you had tribalism at work. This early church was divided. Jewish Christians against Gentile Christians in the same church. Two rivals, two tribes. And so perhaps this tribalism is not so new after all. Perhaps this problem with tribalism has always existed. Indeed, it has always existed in every generation, in every ethnicity, and on every continent. My friends, it is true, indeed, that tribalism thoroughly permeates our sinful nature So that we not only see it in politics, which we do, and we not only see it in culture, which we do, but we also see it right here in the church as well. It is everywhere. It was in Ephesus. It is in the church today. But how can a church know if it's succumbed to tribalism per se? I can remember being a part of a church many years ago, once upon a time, where it had an extra $350,000 in the checking account. Now, I'm not talking a savings account for a rainy day, but I'm talking about the general fund of the checking account. There was $350,000 in that checking account. Long story short, several people in leadership developed a plan to take this money and put it to use to make an addition to the church. However, other people in leadership and other people in the church, they did not want an addition to the church. And so, as can be expected, two groups were formed in the church. 
Each group began having their own private meetings to advance their agenda. They said they were going out to eat after church, but it was more than just eating. It was a meeting. In the pews, you could also see the division. One side wanted the addition. The other side did not want the addition. Even in the fellowship hall, the way that they clustered in the fellowship hall, you could see it as well. And then talking points developed in the church. One group said this. They said, you know, those people over there, they don't love the Lord. They do not want to see the church expanded. And in response, that group looked over here and said, you guys are being wasteful and greedy with the Lord's money and wanting to spend it on material buildings, material stuff. And around and around they went, seeking to get more and more people to join their little tribes Well, dividing people into tiny little groups and breaking the Eighth Commandment up, down, left, and right against each other. By the time they were all done fighting, there was no longer one church, but several tribalistic factions at war with each other in the church. And Jesus Christ, well, he was no longer at the center of any conversation in that church. His forgiveness no longer overflowed into the hearts of the people. His love no longer granted humility and compassion to one another. But instead, suspicion and anger and petty fault-finding, they all ruled. The only person that was happy in this church, well, was Satan. He was gleefully happy. Now, it may surprise you to hear this. It may surprise you to hear this. There was actually nothing wrong with those people taking those sides, taking those positions in the church. Now, please hear me very, very carefully. We Christians, yes, we Christians should have rigorous debate over many things. We should. Let's bring it home. Here at St. Paul's, we should debate things like the remodeling of the basement. We should debate what we do with church land. We should debate what kind of carpet to put in the sanctuary. We should debate what percentage of our budget to give to district missions. We should debate how to remodel the kitchen. We should debate all of that. It is good to talk about those things, and it is completely fine to disagree. But what isn't fine? Mark this. It isn't fine if you and I become tribalistic in these endeavors. If we allow these items to create a wedge between one another. It isn't fine if we, well, if we take those that we disagree with and we make them into villains. It is not fine if we break bread only with these people and not these people because they oppose us on one of these issues. Now, the reason why it is not fine is that these items, which let's just group them all together and call them carpet issues. Carpet issues, if you will. You see, these carpet issues are not what unify us as a church. They are secondary to true unity. In the end, these carpet issues, they are like grass and they will wither away. They will be burned up at the great eschaton with everything else. And so, baptized saints, the Apostle Paul tells the Christians in Ephesus that they were called into Christ's kingdom. And since they were called into Christ's kingdom, they were called to travel on the same road in the same direction. In other words, the Lord establishes unity in the church. Christians do not create unity because we're not the ones who started this Christian faith to begin with. And so this supreme, this ultimate, this ultimate, this quintessential unity of the Christian church is not found in our agreement over carpet issues. But it's found in the one master. It's found in the one faith. It's found in the one baptism. The one God and Father who is, well, above all and rules all. But again, we have to make note of this. We have to be perfectly clear. This does not mean that everyone should look, speak, and act the same. God forbid if we all wear the same shoes, wear the same attire, and talk all the same. God forbid that. That is not what we're saying. There will indeed be differences of opinion in the church. There should be, because we have different vocations. We have different spiritual gifts. We have different backgrounds. However, as previously stated, since we do not find our unity over carpet issues, instead, out of the generosity of Christ, we actually get to be humble and gentle with one another when we have disagreements. 
over remodeling projects, when we have disagreements over budget items, when we have disagreements over district giving and kitchen projects and land resources and on and on and on, whatever comes our way for the next several decades as a church. We actually get to be alert and we get to notice the differences and then to be quick to mend broken fences. Perhaps we could say it this way. We can make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace by making sure that we do not let carpet issues lead us to tribalism, a tribalism that usurps our oneness in Christ. Dear friends, remember, in the Christian church, and in this church, St. Paul's Lutheran Church, there's only one tribe. There's only one tribe. There are sinners who have been purchased by the blood of Christ. That is it. That is you. That is me. We are sinners who have been purchased by the blood of Christ, redeemed unto Christ, forgiven in Christ. And so know this today. Here at St. Paul's, we could be completely and totally divided on a great number of things and yet at the same time be completely and totally unified. Think of it this way. What could we say here? Baptized saints, what is better? A church completely divided over carpet issues but united in Christ or a church united in carpet issues and divided over Christ? One more time. Listen very carefully. What is better? A church completely divided over carpet issues but united in Christ or a church united in carpet issues and divided over Christ? Now, it does not hurt. It does not hurt to be united on carpet issues. That doesn't hurt at all. However, it is not necessary. It is not necessary for true unity. For true unity as a Christian. Indeed, the true unity of us as a church, as Christians, is in the Lord's word and sacrament that is for each and every one of you. You and I, we are called. We're called into the Christian church. We're called to this Christian faith through baptisms. We're snatched from darkness unto life. We're called into this church through baptism. We're placed in the holy ark of the Christian church to hear God's word. And we are called together to be at this table to receive the Lord's good gifts for us. The Lord has done all of this for you and for me. Which means that true unity, that true unity can never be destroyed. It can never be destroyed. Indeed, our unity, brothers and sisters, is in Jesus. It is in Christ. And the rest? Ah, the rest is just details. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I ask you to please stand with one heart and one voice in Christian unity. Let us confess our faith as expressed in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, From thence he will come to judge the living of the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, author of all concord, You will that your people be one, knit together. We pray that you knit together your holy church, that according to their vocations, they may join in humble service to the world and jubilant praise of you, the only God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, bless all Christian homes with your presence. Make them places of peace and refuge in Christ. Strengthen all married couples that their union as husband and wife might be a reflection of Christ and his church. Lord, in your mercy hear our prayer. Almighty God, uphold Joseph, our president, Doug, our governor, and all of our leaders. 
direct their work toward the common good of all people, as found in God's law written on our hearts and in your righteous decrees, especially to protect the unborn and those who cannot speak for themselves. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, look in kindness upon those who have been humbled by the troubles of this life. We pray especially for Brian and Kari, Carl, Charlotte, Cindy, Connie, Deb, Dennis, Fern, Gail, Hayden, Isaac, Jason, Jeff, Jerry, Joellen, Callie, Kim, Megan, Mark, Marilyn, Marley, Miles, Philip, Randy, Roger, Ruth, Sharon, Shirley, Tom, and Travis. Lift them up in healing and renew their strength to serve you in what you have called them to do. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us, Heavenly Father, for the sake of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated for the offering music as a way to reminder the offering plate is in the back of the sanctuary. Offerings can be mailed to the church office or conducted through the church website online. Ask congregation to please stand for the offertory on 781. As we continue to the service of the sacrament on page 160, we continue in repentance and faith to receive the gifts the Lord has for us in his body and blood given and shed for us. If you're not a member of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, or one of our sister denominations, we do still invite you to please come forward, kneel at the rail, and cross your arms to receive a blessing this morning. And if you'd like to partake of this wonderful gift for the altar plaque, please talk to me after the service about membership here at St. Paul's. We continue on 160. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. Truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times, at all places, give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. 
Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, He gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Pastor Congregation, please remain standing as we thank the Lord. the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Congregation may be seated for the departing hymn, hymn number 700, hymn number 700.
as we heard in the sermon and our text today, true unity cannot be created by us, nor can it be destroyed, because there's one Lord, one baptism, one faith. You, as a church, are brothers and sisters in Christ, unified in that blood and that forgiveness. Go in that peace and that unity with one Lord. Amen.